This is the uh, study of the Indian Golden Period, 200 BC to 500 AD. And I'm going to be presenting geography and people. And um, this is a, a theme that is running. So this is one part of a paper, but then you will see how they link together with the uh, others. <coughs> 200 BC, 500 AD, um, there was a period, this was a period of prosperity, security, well-being, and creativity. And we will follow through on how that happened. Agriculture, trade, services, administration. And we will also, um, one of the most important here, I think, is um, agriculture. Ag agriculture becomes the mainstay of the society. Um, empires come into being, disappear, another empire comes in, but agriculture maintains itself. And this was a very important period for agriculture because it had really um, developed and increased its um, production. Um, trade, services, administration, but the village uh, community and the joint family were really the um, pillars of this um, society that had come into being. So geography, people, land cover, irrigation, soil, topology, food, vocation, arts. This is just to give you a flavor of the landscape of the Indian subcontinent. It was very difficult to um, decide which slides to pick. So um, I randomly did that. Um, first, I'd just like to say a few words about the Himalayan. Himalayans are north of the, um, the Indian subcontinent, and uh, they've been very fortunate to us in the sense that they've protected us in, in one way, that others could not invade, at least at a certain point, and we know that the northwest was problematic. But that gave us a long period of uh, <coughs> developing this culture, and this, this culture is very unique because it had the time to develop. Um, the other uh, slide I'd like to uh, talk about is the Dutton Plateau, because this is where uh, you, know, you have the plains, then you have this um, area where, um, for the long, longest period earlier, they had vo vo volcanic disruptions. And so it created an entirely different kind of uh, space. And this, uh, there's the uh, Krishna uh, uh, River running here, but these are tabletop uh, plateaus, which are essential to, um, to uh, South Asia. These are the uh, rivers. If you look at the map, you'll see the rivers and the tributaries. Um, the Indian subcontinent has a very a natural uh, wealth for, especially for agriculture. And this was, the nature did help the population in creating this uh, condition. And these are very important rivers, Indus, Ganges, the Gauga. Forests. Uh, there are uh, four or five types of forests in different areas. And they're different, but yet they cover a, a large uh, amount of uh, large parts of India except that's the narrow part where the, uh, the um, 
and the flat areas. So all around you'll see uh, the evergreens, you'll see uh, the other thing is that right from the job, above the job, to Kanyak market, you get teak. So it's, um, uh, it's the forest of a certain type that goes right down from uh, that area. Now I want to come to uh, still geography, but also involved with empires and people. So by um, 200 BC to 580, um, the Maurya Empire had fallen. And so now uh, king, different kingdoms came into play in different areas. So um, kingdom states uh, came into being and spread the, and began to be um, independent after the fall of the Maurya. Uh, regions began to develop agriculture, though agriculture was already existing, but also perfecting it. Um, trade and um, govern, governed independently. Uh, creation of new uh, nations uh, begins. Language and culture and economies begin to have separate historical uh, identities. Uh, so the structure of the empire uh, still continued but without the centralized force earlier um, between uh, and the impact of the Nanda and the Mauryan Empire, they were much more uh, closed and they um, really developed, I would say, the administration and the um, uh, agrarian state. And now this was the next play. And this is where we see the development of um, the culture, literature. So all this actually expounds into uh, uh, larger and larger um, uh, space. So agriculture, um, farming um, had become the mainstay, as we know even today in India, uh, you know, farming. And it was the farming uh, production that was a success. One, it feeds people. Two, it also plays a part in trade. Because if you say, for example, take cotton, it's grown in the, um, on the land, but yet um, it's made into cloth. So um, India did a lot of trade in cotton all over the world, and also in uh, other minerals, in jewelry, in precious stones, I mean, the amount of um, um, export they did was uh, huge. Soils of the Indian subcontinent. I just put two, uh, one, the, the pottery. So the, when, every, uh, you know, when everyone talks about pottery, the different colors of pottery, depends on where the um, soil comes from. So a lot of this soil actually comes from the rivers because it's really um, softened and it's um, easy to uh, pull together this clay. Um, on the, uh, there's a map there in which um, we're showing um, the different kinds of soils. And if you look uh, at from the Himalayan mountains and then you see a green patch very right along. That's the alluvial uh, soil, which was very important. But, same time, Indians didn't depend just on the alluvial soil. They really found techniques of how to generate and to create soil for agriculture. And they had great success in that. The other thing is um, irrigation. Um, irrigation uh, is a very important um, uh, part of agriculture. And as agriculture began, that problem came uh, into play right away. And so, um, so because uh, plants need a moist soil, so the, the Indian um, subcontinent deals with this in many different ways. 
collecting water in watersheds, uh, digging wells, canals, damming rivers. And this was the uh, responsibility of the administration. And the um, guilds provided the engineers who would do this work. So why I mentioned the guilds, the administration, and the agriculturists, that there was this linkage and this synergy between these people. That everybody was working towards the same goal. So I think that is what I call success in this um, society that we're looking at at this moment. People. Now we want to uh, look at who are these people. Um, you know, if we look at the list, we see the um, Alvars, the Sakas, the Zatrans, the Kalingas, and there's also this. Uh, there also are also um, uh, many other uh, people in this area. And where do they live? They live in. Um, Mahajanpats, and, and there are also smaller Janpats. So this is the area where um, uh, people live, and you can see that um, there's a concentration in at the Ganges River. That to, uh, from east to north, you can see, and on the other side you see uh, Gandhar and uh, Cambodia um, around the, uh, the uh, Indus River. Now, these villages, we are going to do a little bit of work on these villages to see who, who these people are and how do they um, work. So the village people, uh, they would be landholders, cultivators, landless agricultural laborers, craftsmen, weavers, potters, uh, blacksmiths, carpenters, uh, petty traders, brahmins, milkmen, barbers, washermen. Cow herders, entertainers, hunters, jandalas, and other opportunities, women and children. And with that, uh, we have to come to what kind of organization did they have. A uh, joint family uh, was headed by the patriarch. And so it was a joint family. So the patriarch, he would be the eldest male. Uh, and younger brothers of the patriarch, children, grandchildren, wife of the patriarch, wives of all the brothers and male children, uh, grandparents. This would be uh, the sort of uh, family, joint family. Like for example, if I take my family, um, there was 55 people living together. So it's not, they're not small numbers, uh, they can be very large numbers. Enjoy saying career. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, producers. Producers were farmers, craftsmen, weavers, potters. And, and this list is very important of weighing that there's producers and there's providers. And if you look at the producers, they're a small number and the providers are a large number. So this really, this um, society was able to uh, feed uh, themselves. Cities. Who were the producers? There were artisans and guilds. And um, service providers were the kings, queens. I, it's really important to understand that they are actually providing something to this society. Ministers, royal priests, military, doctors, teachers, courtesans, traders, maids, sweepers, etc. Forests. There was forests and there were people living in the forest. So there were forest dwellers. And this is all at the same time. Um, Hunter-gatherers, animal husbandry was being um, done there, timber and medical plants. There was a, a relationship between um, forest dwellers, hunter-gatherers, with the villages, with the cities. It wasn't separation. This was all one and they helped each other and they also uh, created uh, some kind of income for each other. Sanghas, uh, men and women uh, uh, joined the Sanghas. So Jain monks, Buddhist monks, 
and others lived not in the villages, not in the um, cities, but in the remote areas, but they lived together. A little bit about um, like real cities. Um, Taxila um, was a trading post and also a high learning center for, um, for the Indian uh, subcontinent and the world. Um, and a lot of uh, famous uh, teachers, gurus, taught there. And people came uh, from China, Central Asia, um, and it was also uh, uh, close to the Silk Route. So that trading, that relationship uh, between uh, trade, Silk Road, and the caravans would go, this was the way the caravan would um, direct themselves. And Bhagavad had a relationship with the Taxila. It was the channel that um, was used uh, for the Silk Um, I, did, I, I thought I'd um, take a uh, city as a drawing that somebody had done. It was a great city. So was Daxila. I mean, this is a, these were cities that um, I think um, it is said that um, 300,000 people lived there. And it had 64 gates and it was uh, barred by uh, wooden planks and it had a boat. Um, but what was important, why partly for them? And I think, um, again, it's for trading and exporting goods, and its location was very important. Um, Gandak River, which flows from the north side of the city and merges into the Ganges. Swan River enters into Ganges from the south. So this was a strategic uh, place to be where you could control uh, uh, what was happening within the uh, rivers. In, the, in other words, um, the, the goods could be controlled by you. And also that um, you could control the forests, the lumber, and coal and iron uh, from the nearby mines, which were very, very important. So they really had control. Um, if they had control there, they could really control a lot of areas of um, the uh, place. And also, for them, it was important that um, because in the, uh, on the Ganges you had a huge amount of villages and so they could uh, 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 pick their armies from there very easily. So they had a standing army which was huge. And it, because of this um, condition of, of location, uh, it was uh, uh, very important. Now the other, uh, you know, we said about well-being and health. Uh, the Indian subcontinent had really worked out very early um, a question of health because I think, like when uh, you know Harappa and these areas were um, uh, set up, they also had to deal with what kind of um, um, when you live in uh, when you live close to each, each other. It's a different kind of uh, situation from where it's hunter gathering. So you, you you create your own new diseases, and then you also have to deal with that. So I read it was a, um, a very important um, concept of um, how to be able to uh, uh, look at medicine, uh, create medicines, and then be able to. Uh, take them all over, not just in India, in, in South Asia, but also they uh, uh, did a trade with that. So, uh, 2000 BC to 500 AD, Indian subcontinent saw growth in food, food security, uh, settled population, and created new um, culture uh, with the success and spread of agriculture and trade and uh, trade the inhabitants of the Indian subcontinent experienced massive changes in their lives. Good food, good health, good living 
and fading of the old tribal bonds to new agrarian um, relations meant seeing the world and themselves in new ways. Food, from food gathering to food growing was a great leap by humanity and the Indians of the continent. With the success of agriculture and creation of the agrarian state, um, empires were able to advance the expansion of uh, industry, trade, and culture. Um, conclusion, farmers, craftsmen, service providers, rulers generated a great deal of wealth, which provided stability, security, and well-being, which led to great creative, creativity and individual expression. Questions? Um, how prevalent was untouchability? Um, you know, it's mentioned, uh, literature mentions uh, of, um, of Chandalas. Uh, and also, what is the position of women? There are strong anti women um, statements in the Art Shastra, one is on the day, one is on the Vishnu, and others. Um, how wide was the practice of Sati? Mahabharata mentions it, we should inquire into what took place and also what was the position of women, I think was a really important uh, actor. And these were some of my references. Thank you. We can take a few questions for our Martin. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you've done any further research on women during this period, but it seems like they get short shrift. Yeah, I think, um, yeah. I think the um, uh, question of women is that we have to look further in the past because something took place much earlier in which already women's position had fallen. So I think um, that's why I, I, it's difficult to do it in this <coughs> portion because they, it's historical. It's much further. So, um, what, but we do hear of history jokes in in this area where women are, um, you know, have, have their own um, states in that sense. But we need to really do a lot of work to be able to find out why, what took place, and why did it happen this way. Prem is a technology professional and works for the Oracle Corporation. Um, he's a researcher in the field of cognitive science and contributes scientific papers to this field. He's a poet and scholar in Hindi and serves as a director of our India Discovery Center. So, Prem Thank you. Thank you very much, Sonu Javani, for, for a nice introduction. Now, study of India, Indian golden period of this particular time frame, and this session we will be discussing the language and literature. And this session I have broken into two pieces, the language first and the literature uh, subsequently. So let's get to the how it works? <laughs> oh, sorry, I can figure out. Now, the highlights of this period, if I have to sum up, uh, we are coming up with a few statements, and the that there is a continuing <coughs> efforts in codification of the language. Mm -hmm. This effort brought standardization of grammar and a full development of script for the writing. The discourses on the meaning, sound, I mean, 
on the meaning of the sound and words were done at this particular period. Now, this entire thing resulted into massive secular literature development. And, of course, the formal education institutions were established because the vast literature was available to educate society. And this entire process which was going on in this particular period and prior to it led to some level of standardization of Indian languages. Now the question comes, what is language codification? I mean, why are we, uh, you know, emphasizing that there was a codification which was done earlier and at this time? Now the codification is to prescribe uses protocol of sound and the symbols. The, essentially these two parts, the phonics and the script. And then the because the sound strings and makes a word. It's the sound which we are uttering, and that is the, the pieces. Uh, we are making them as words. Now this helps the, 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 you know, the developing the meaning of the etymology and helps create scripts, symbols, for representing the speech sound. Now, this is very important because how are we representing a speech sound? Because speech can have intonation, Speech, speech, speech can have emotions. You know, there are a variety of contents when we deliver anything. Uh, this entire process was empirical, of course, and uh, the, it was the first step in developing grammar. In the earlier period, the Vedic period, around 400 BC, finally developed a scientific qualification based on <coughs> variety of other people's work as well. And this led, you know, we believe that this has helped stimulate the codification of other languages in India at that time. The development of grammar and codification, the artic articulation of human speech was studied empirically. The Pani, which is what I was referring to around 400 BC, he compiled a literature on the location and the manner of articulation of syllables. The way they speak, there is a particular basis of the, you know, the entire apparatus, what we use to produce a particular. So he created a science behind this. And the Grammarian established rules of articulation that would generate the synthetic speech sound. The organization of parts of speech, syntax, and phonics of human speech was very carefully studied. And as a function of accent and geography, you know, people speak at a different places in a different manner. And the identification of syllables that led to the development of script as a visual representation. The script enabled the recording of materials and the widespread dissemination process in educating the society was triggered at this particular point in time. Now, from speech to, uh, you know, representing them in a, you know, some kind of a script. So what is the process, uh, you know, this entire thing has gone? In Sanskrit, the word varna, which is nothing but an articulation unit, is the basic linguistic sound that gets organized into phonemes, swaras, and consonants, vendinas. The phonemes are, or the vowel phonemes are, uttered on their own and classified on, through utterances. And similarly, the consonants, they need vowel to articulate. Without vowel, you cannot articulate a particular con any consonant. And that's the idea here. Either when you're speaking or when you're writing, there is always a consonant, I mean, a vowel involved uh, with a consonant. Vowels are self supported, and vowel either with a consonant or by itself forms a syllable. Now, I'm just trying to give you how that, uh, uh, you know, the speech to uh, script, how that. One of those two examples which I have listed here, the vowel sign. 
When vowel is attached to a consonant, this vowel is orthographically represented in a different form known as matra. You know, that's the concept here. And it is a consonant called ka, and it's, you know, the vowel called a. And when you add them together, you say ka, not ka, ka. So this is how that is represented when you are writing in a script. So this is, this is one way of representing your speech sound in the script so that you are able to, when you are reading that, you are able to understand what that really meant when, when the person spoke. Similarly, there are modifiers, the vowel modifiers. By visualization and reserve, the consonants modifies indicate a differentiation in pronunciation. Now there is a very subtle example again with a consonant called a and a bindu. Uh, how that point can make a difference in, in a pronunciation. So when you add that point on a consonant a, this becomes an. You know, that's the pronunciation. So when you are speaking an, this is the way it is written, so that there is a one-to-one -one relationship. Now, evolution of Indian languages, and I'm sure it is gone in other parts of the world as well. There, there are certain steps we, we take, we have gone through for thousands and thousands of years. We were living in tribal society thousands of years ago. The tribal society was members of generally connected, uh, you know, by blood family. And they were living in a group. And they shared a native language within that group, whatever language it made sense to them to interact. When multiple tribes start living together, because of whatever reason, they form clan, and they comprise many tribes, of course, and the language evolves into a, you know, a, a kind of a dialect with limited grammar and no writing system. Now, these are the common protocol, which is we call grammar, we develop over a period, and that becomes part of your communication, part of your writing. So that's what I'm trying to highlight here. Now, when the multiple clans start living together in a you know, larger geography, which is, so they have to have some commonly understood semantic structures. So that's how a language evolves from tribal to clan to multiple clans to now the urbanization, which is in cities. The language evolves further to the mix of population because multiple clans have started living together in a city. And there is a foreign contamination because there is a trading activity. People come from outside. They bring new words, new ideas. So how do we integrate them into the, you know, the common language structure? Now, this is uh, just an example I'm giving. And the detailed chart is at the back of the presentation, of course. Now, this is a language evolution at this particular period. And there are three columns I'm using here. Language in use at that time. What was the source language or the dialect which contributed in creating that language? And at the end of the period, what is the dialect of language which got established, which becomes a, which becomes a language further on? So, in the Vindya Mountains, around 300 uh, current year, uh, there were two languages which were in use, Guru Bhasha and Pashati. These languages were developed based on a Prakrit language and Pali and Munda language. Now, if you come to the Ganges, you know, east and west of Ganges, there was a language which Patanjali classified as upper branch, and that's the name that it adopted. So that upper branch was about the combination of Prakrit, Pali, Kharikoti, Braj, Abhidhi, Maithali, you know, variety of languages contributed in development of that particular language. Sarasun, it was at the central zone of India, and there are many dialects and, uh, you know, languages which contributed into that. Similarly, Gandhari Prakrit, which was in the northwestern and Gandhara in the Central Asia region, which was also a product of Prakrit and Vedic Sanskrit. 
Now this entire belt, and I call it as a northern belt because it was probably northern India, and I call it the Prakrit belt because primarily a different Prakrit flavors of these languages were start, I mean, were in use at that time. And the direct language we still call upper branch based on Patanjali's classification. And that becomes a, some kind of a language which gets it will develop into Hindi over a period after a while. And Hindi is the one of the popular languages today. Now, in the southern India, and which I'm calling it as a Dravidian language, because that was the language of the common people, the old Tamil, which is considered one of the longest surviving classical languages in the world, which was available in South of India and Sri Lanka. And these were the, uh, uh, you know, the dialects and languages which contributed in the development of old times. And the derivative language which got established at this particular period was Tamil. Now let's look at the phonetics and script because for each language what was the phonetics and what was the script used and who was the grammarian who created that relationship or that entire grammar for that particular language. Now again, this is a classification. There are three columns and two segments. Language script in Ramiran and the segments are in the northern belt and the another segment is in the southern belt. Now, the practice as a language that has a lot of literature with the government was using a script called Brahmi or Karushti. The Ramiran at that time who established this uh, you know, what script and what language and what grammar as a Varaluchi. And he established that relationship. For Upper Branch Bhasha, the Brahmi was the script which was used, or a flavor of Brahmi. I mean, there is always a differentiation from one geography to another geography. Similarly, Pali also used a Brahmi language, and Pakyana was the person, uh, the grammarian for this particular language. Udravi Bhasha, or the Udravi Bhasha, which is a Old or the proto Odia language, and I don't know the, the grammar. But if you come to the southern belt, there were three languages simultaneously developing at that time. The old Tamil, which is uh, uh, was also using a Tamil flavor of Brahmi script, and Agatha and Kalkopian, they were the two grammarians who contributed in the developing the grammar of that particular language. And in the Kannada, uh, you know, that physical area. The Kambala and Kanara script, these are the two scripts we found, I mean, the, no, uh, people have found, and where the Kanara words were engraved. And that's the reason we are saying that there is a, uh, you know, uh, this particular language was in use at that particular point in time. Similarly, for Telugu, uh, again, a Telugu flavor of Brahmi script and the inscriptions appears, starts appearing around 600, 700 CE with the uh, words of Telugu language at that time. Now, I'm, this uh, is a structure, I'm trying to give you a flavor that around 400 BC, the Panini is a Sanskrit grammarian who created this vowels and consonants and how many vowels and how many consonants, <laughs> what language and what the combination, you know that entire grammar structure which he created. What I'm trying to show you here is that there is a, some kind of an adaptation of that grammar structure which was created by Parini uh, and the Sanskrit and Prakrit, uh, you know I'm just giving that what are the consonants and vowels and then there is other languages adopted that structure and that biological mechanism by which you produce that particular syllable. So there is a vowels, number of vowels in each language and number of consonants in each language. But Tamil language maintained their own uh, very special, uh, you know, both vowels and consonant structure and the manner of uh, production of that particular uh, you know, syllables. So other than Tamil, all other Indian languages, most of them, most of the Indian languages adopted the Indian structure. And this is what I'm trying to demonstrate here. 
Now, philosophy of language. Bhattori was one of the philosophers and was considered one of the most original philosophers of the language. Around this time, he created a text called Wikipedia, where he analyzed what is a sentence, what is a word, what is an utterance, how do you develop the meaning of it. So that's the uh, theory here, or that's the philosophy he has been coming up with. And he defined what is the constituents of a, a sentence, and how a of speech involves three states. Now this is an experimentation he's doing that before you are making an utterance, what are those three stages mentally you're going through before you make the utterance? So this is what he, uh, he you know, philosophized at that time. And uh, if you look at today, I think maybe there are 10, 12 neurological states before we you know, come to the utterance from thought to utterance. <laughs> now meaning is a functional sentence as a whole and derived, uh, you know, we derive the meaning based on the words used, the, based on the combination of the words used in a, in a particular sentence, and how it is delivered, with the anger or sweetness or, you know, so what is the posturing or what is the emotion uh, in that particular sentence. Now, he also came up with the concept of sport, which conveys the essence of a particular utterance, which you have seen which we are calling it as an integral linguistic symbol when meaning is comprehended. Now, the meaning of the word is fixed. I mean, a word always means the same, wherever. However, the context, the emotion, makes the meaning of the word different. Now, you have seen that uh, people were very prosperous and you know, very happy and things were uh, quite uh, secure and people were, you know, trying to do art and culture, etc. So, the concept of aesthetics was developing tremendously at this time. The concept of uh, rasa, rasa is a, uh, it's very difficult to define, but let's take this word for a minute. So rasa is embedded in an utterance. So when you speak, that anger, you know, sweetness or whatever, I'm calling that as a rasa. The rasa is embedded in an utterance. Rasa is a latent condition that pervades the body. And it's a psychological condition because that, that's the mental state we attain once we attain a particular rasa. And humans are endowed with power that connects mind through rasa. A bhav is an expression, you know, the bodily expression which we come up with when we are feeling, we we'll get embarrassed or, you know, we become a little different, our color changes, you know, all those uh, expressions. Now, humans are endowed with bhav, then sound modulation conveys the intent to listener that affects rasa and activates bhav. Now, what it means is that uh, it affects rasa means your mental state changes. With that, the, there is a, some kind of a, uh, a trigger which, which triggers your expression in the body. By, you may change your hands, gesture, or you know, other details. Now the bhasa, bhava is a rooted in latent rasa that activates bhava in the body and manifests rasa that in turn reinforces bhava in the body and making us immersed in rasa. What it means is, what it means is that there is an interplay of our expression, of our mental state, and that interplay is ultimately creates rasa and we get emerged. <laughs> Mimamsa, I'll just go through quickly on this because I have little time. Now, it emphasizes the perception, the reaction. There are two distinct states, that's the theory of authority and you know, other layers. The external perception arises from interaction of five senses with an object. When you are interacting, all your five senses receive that stimulus and then integrates it and you, know, you make certain perception. And then there is an internal perception. And this is an inner sense which we call 
pratipa or intuition. And this is how this play, interplay of these two leads to anuman, which is an inference, which consists of your hypothesis, your reasoning, your example, and then you come to upman, which is comparison and analogy of the existing imprints in the brain. That means you start bouncing against the, the memories which you have, and then you come up with what brain means. Now, under literature, the second part, so these are the topics which I am discovering, and the, there are different types of literature which I have listed here. So, Shruti literature, there is a definition given, then Ayurveda, which is a, one of the texts, which is also called Shruti literature. The Samhita, they are also called Samhitas because of their beneficial effects. Smriti literature, which is ascribed to you know, the early human car and on, you know, passed to us, passed to us through time. Ramayana, Mahabharata and Manusmriti, these are the texts which were created at this particular point in time. The Shastra literature, which is just nothing but regulatory knowledge, right? A document, the Mahabharata, on a topic of public interest and documenting the social practices and prescription of use. And out of the Shastra literature, that is economics, you know, the public tax which deals with how people are in relationship and their taxation, and how the entire interplay should be. And Nakshastra, which is dramaturgy, these are the two great examples. And Sutra, which is a connected thread, which is evocative statements, and there are certain examples available. And there is another type of literature, Kavya and Nata, that is poetry and uh, drama. I'll come to. <coughs> The, the science of poetic ornamentation. Now this is something new which happened during this particular period that how the poetry is conveyed in such a manner that uh, you, you start ornamenting your expressions. So our empire is nothing but ornamenting expression by use of figures of speech like metaphor, hyperbole, and naturalistic utterances. The idea of a <coughs> now, <laughs> okay, so I have uh, used uh, uh, Alida's, uh, you know, literature and in explaining the, uh, this entire uh, idea of, uh, you know, the poetic organization. The next thing which came very beautifully at this particular time was storytelling idea. And uh, the storytelling is nothing but fast, you know, experience in a narrative form when you say something to somebody, that's a story you are trying to convey. And today, you find in India, this traditional style of storytelling still prevails. Now, there are many aspects. I think this presentation will be also available on the uh, websites after a week or two. Now, with this vast literature which was developed, then the education sector started coming because there is a need to educate society in general. So Takshila was one and Nalanda was uh, another and there is a process and what kind of people were coming at this particular place. Uh, before I come to them, because my 45 minutes are over, I would summarize that the protoforms of many languages, uh, which we are in, which are in use in India today, are rooted in this part of view. The same structure developed at that time continued till present day, and knowledge empowerment led to the freedom of speech and other literature literature was created at that particular time. Poetry and drama literature matured and attained a genetic at this particular time. Need for an organized knowledge dissemination led to the education center. Thank you very much. that in the next period because Gujarati will come in that period. Okay. And it's an excellent question. I think we should be prepared for next time to answer that. Yeah. There is 
the re relation between German and Sanskrit? I heard that uh, German language, they are thinking that uh, they are connected with Sanskrit. So how, how is that? German language also. Yeah, German. So are we like, See, we the derivative of that? Or? I, I am not able to <laughs> say authoritatively yes or no. It's European. Yes. My yeah. opinion is that possible there is an influence, yeah. but I don't think so. That <laughs> language Sanskrit is the language of you know that area at that time. If we don't have proof, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Yeah. So let's be very clear on that. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. See, the, uh, for the question Sanskrit and German, yeah. there's all kinds of theories about it. Yeah. Um, and most of them are untrue. <laughs> but the, the question is, the, the Germans got very interested <laughs> in understanding or thinking that probably they have a root. So they thought India was the root, Sanskrit was the root. Yeah. But then there was difficulty in saying that Indians don't look like fathers. How can we have a root there? So it could be that they are children. So that kind of a thing developed into what we call colonialism. That is the Indians, even though they invented Sanskrit, right? But they do not look like the right people who can invent Sanskrit. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, with that we shall see how exactly things will happen. But I tell you, we're running late because of me, also because of the St. Thomas, because of many other things. So we're going to reschedule ourselves. I have a beautiful honor today. See, he talked about the Russia, the Vava, the aesthetics, the Sanskrit developed grammar. Through grammar, codification came. Through codification, the language or the literature it was not hymnal anymore. The literature is that what's a tree, what's a cloud, what's the mountain, what's water. So how do I relate to it? So that's the similes. So the beautiful poetry developed. So what we'll see here now is the so-called climax of that poetic period. The whole Europe is sleeping by this time. People are fighting. And here, there's a man called Kalidasha in India. He's creating this magnificent poetry. Now, before that, the poetic exploration has taken place. But then he takes to a very high height. How? Because he imagines. He imagines. So what you'll hear is, can we start? What we, what we hear is, is the, his depiction of the so-called birth of God. And the God is a function of, is born through the Himalayas, the mountains. And mountain has not only its roughness, it also has its softness. So all that they will show in the poetic variation. The Vedic poetry was more monotonic. And here you will see how the pitch, how the tone, how the language, how the operation, how does it kind of fluctuate, move on. It took thousand years later, it came to Europe. So here, Sri Lakshmi Srinivasan, so she will sing from the beautiful poet Kailasha called Kumar Shambhavam. And then we have the honor of having <laughs> Uh, so they said that there has to be a, a direct perception for a valid source of knowledge. And they said that influence of higher powers doesn't exist and everything happens yet the chair, which is they, they, they happen with chance. Then there was a Jain system. They have, they have decided for the individual responsibility. <coughs> Not the outside forces or influences. Outside forces or influences, they don't affect your you, they don't affect how you behave. So basically it is your own actions that you should be responsible for. So instead of going undergoing all those sacrificial rituals and uh, during wedding times there was animal slaughter also. So they they prescribe 
progressively harsh personal atonement for every bad action. So it is like this that you do a bad action and then you do atonement and then over that if you do if you if you do not do another bad action, then you, it becomes progressively harsh. This led to the inaction that eventually affected the very very life adversity. Do you have the, the No, actually the, there is a technical difficulty in that because uh, we ran out of batteries. So I have to do the freelancing. So just hold it up. We oh, okay. Yeah. So that karma was considered responsible for the transformation of individual souls. Which means that you go through different cycles of birth and death and then you depending on your karma, you attain to a higher form of life. Then there was a Buddhist... <laughs> Buddhist belief in the achievement of goal over perfection. So you do your work, but finish it, but don't, don't hanker for the perfection. That you, it has to be perfect. So during the very times you have to do the rituals, the prescribed way, to the priest craft, and then uh, if you want to uh, attain dharma, you can come. And then the this this started to go beyond the rational explanation of why certain things are to be done, have to be, have to be done in a certain way. So it should be done without mistake and everything. So those things were questions. So Buddhists then came and they allowed. Good for us. When you, you are human, you can make mistakes and you can achieve goals to the summit, to the summit at the right time. And this allowed a non judgmental of the values, uh, situation of the values. So then came Bhagavad Gita's Meshkar. So in Gita, uh, Krishna has a kind of soul <coughs> uh, view. To explain his philosophy to Arjuna. So, Krishna proposed the concept of desireless action, where the individual soul does not get anxious or uh, you don't hanker after the truth. You do actions and don't uh, look for the truth. So, a true sannyasin is the one who rejects the actions over goals. So, you do action, don't look for the uh, so any action whether it bears desire food or oh sorry like an ice cream cone <laughs> okay <laughs> and it should not be attached to the gratification of the senses so this is karma sanyas so there is shloka in the 18th chapter of Gita kamyanam karnam nyasam sanyasam kavyo do sarvakar karvatyam prahus kyaar chakram so what is kyaar and what is sanyas so Kyagi is the one who renounces the fruits of actions altogether. And unattached performance of actions lead to, leads to liberation. So then yoga came. Yoga, yoga Sutra by Vasudhini embodied the science of mind control. So the, he gave the tools of Star Yoga uh, uh, to do the mind control. And it established the concept of psychic energy and analyzing to attain a particular state. So unlike the mind mindfulness of Buddhism that helps in the elimination of random thoughts and uh, uh, the aim of uh, Ashtanga Yoga actually what it wanted to do is to transcend from the individual identity to a fuller cosmic energy. So I am the universe. I am in the universe is in me. And that way yoga empowers an individual to identify with the universe. And uh, so it is transcending. It, it tries to get you beyond the normal activities. So it's, it's a transcendent. The yogic practice uh, helped the individual mind, mind to go beyond consciousness of the physical body. And that removed the memory connection. So you are, you are not you to, to, to your memory, binding your memory with, with yourself. You are different. So when you separate that out, uh, you, you go beyond your consciousness. So then, so this whole pre-thinking uh, 
system uh, is held in uh, freedom of expression. So all the schools at that time in the golden period, they influenced each other, they were going parallel to each other. And uh, it, it helped uh, in that whole development of new, new society. This was because, because it, there was a, the burden of uh, good or bad actions was lifted uh, from the individuals. So they, don't, they didn't have any fear of retribution or uh, from the great divine powers or royalty in that case and then uh, all others in the society. So that helped to have a kind of pre-thinking. And this had a profound impact on the society. Uh, so they became prosperous as we observed in the previous presentations. And they were scholarly, they were creative. And every individual had a role in the development of society. So nobody was left behind in the, in the overall development of the uh, nation of society. So from uh, Buddhist gave this concept of Sangha. So Sangha is a group of like-minded people. Speak up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we can't hear you. There's so much okay. work. Yeah. Okay, so so the so some means different different people of the, from different walks of life uh, who gather together uh, to make the sun. And they 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 follow the Buddha's teachings. And this concept has a, had a social impact on the status of women. So women were, were also included as we saw in the earlier presentation. And it, it, that could be observed by the artistic and cultural productivity from the period. So one of the uh, greatest, I can say, uh, philosophers during that time was Narayana. He proposed the theory of uh, Anikthetas, so Arshanikthetas, so it's, everything is momentary in nature in the, the news. And uh, this together with the doctrine of Shunya, so he gave the doctrine of nothingness or Shunya, gave rise to Mahayana, the Mahayana school of uh, Bodhi Buddhism. And they believed in Bodhisattvas. So Bodhisattvas are self realized uh, people who might appear in different places and different phases um, and any human being can attain that uh, condition of being bodhisattva. So this would, that would mean that the higher order of achievement is not a grace like in Hinduism, it is the grace of God or Guru that uh, you attain to the uh, highest possible condition. Um, or liberation. So, in this case, it is your self practice, self uh, observance of the Buddha's teachings, and that would uh, help you to attain the liberation. So, condition happening of events as the existence of object, object is dependent on the other objects. So, all the objects around you, uh, they, they are, they are dependent on the existence of other objects. So this is called Pratitya Samutpada. So Nagarjuna's concept of Nirvana. So Nirvana, as per Nagarjuna, is excluding yourself from the conditions of the wrong view. So your, your perception is not right. That is why you, can, you, you, you fall into that cycle of birth and death. It is, it, but it is not the change in the physical state, but a different perspective. So there is no magical thing about Nirvana according to him. It is day to day, it can happen in the day to day life. You don't have to cross a boundary or another world uh, to attain the Nirvana. It is mundane, it is transactional. Uh, so Nirvana can be achieved uh, by extricating oneself from the real uh, existence. This, this is the state of Shunya. So you, once you attain the state of Shunya, you became, uh, you, you attain the Nirvana. So concept of Shunya. So Shunya according to Nagarjuna is the only real thing. Uh, and this is essenceless. So you, you read, this is hard to explain, but this, 
it is a condition where you, it is not like nothingness, but it's essenceless, basically. So, physical existence in this situation is relative. And so, unlike the Vedic concept of Sat, the, which is the existence is absolute, that is replaced by this Shun, uh, that it, the existence is relative. And Nitya and Nitya are the constructs of the mind. Your mind creates this uh, uh, concept that something is Nitya uh, and something is Anitya. Nitya is uh, existing or permanent. permanent, and Anitya is not permanent. So, extricating yourself from the human construct can be achieved through great meditation. And in the Hindu Sanatan view, that concept is, is maintained by Ishwar. That, that condition is maintained by the Ishwar. So Ishwar or God or whatever, or your Guru, is, uh, maintains this uh, condition of uh, liberation or Nirvana. In the Mahayana view, in this condition, one's existence is void when a candle wick is extinguished. So it is like a candle wick that is extinguished, then the light becomes non existent. So it is like this. Whether the light can come back or not, it depends on the same conditions that might have produced that light. So now they have another school of uh, Buddhism that was Theravada. So and saw that why in the previous slide that the conditions can come back and that gave the existence of that light, that light in the wick. So that is because of the wasm desire to be rekindled and come back again. So that's the second theme of Theravada in Buddhism. This doctrine rests, rests on the Adhatya. So the nature of self is tied to the to the vasana. So unless you you separate these two out, you cannot attain them all. So this is what the concept of Theravada. And that later on moved to Sri Lanka, China, Cambodia, Tibet, and Vietnam. So Buddhist Buddhism gave the concept of human empowerment. So during that golden period, the human empowerment was created by new teachers, new masters. They were, so the, from a Mayan concept, uh, they were as great as Buddhist, Buddha himself. And they could uh, do the same things, that would, uh, teach the same way that Buddha taught. And, but the Vedic followers during that time, they incorporated some of the <coughs> concepts as the uh, incarnation of deities like uh, Vishnu, Shiva, Brahma and the incarnations thereof. Uh, so the idea of absolute divinity can have many many manifestations. So this is like a deity can be born on this earth as Ram or Krishna. So this was the concept of uh, this uh, Vigra. And this was the transition from the creation of Vigra similar to the Mayan process where there could be different stages of realization. So you could be Bodhisattva at different places, different uh, ages um, according to your stage of realization. And so what's the difference between Bodhisattvas and Tirthankaras? So Jain Jain have Jain have Tirthankaras and both Buddhists and Bodhisattvas. So Bodhisattvas created new principles without any prohibitions. And they were not dogmatic. Things can change over the time and then you adjust to the new realities. And the meditative process in Sangha set that allowed the mind to be controlled in a uh, constructive way to concentrate on something or uh, to attain the one. Whereas Jain thinks that are, on the other hand followed a particular principle and championed it. So they, the, throughout the lineage of the Tirthankaras, they had a principle and they kept on championing it uh, throughout the lineage.
So Buddhism uh, on the other hand was the difference is that it was more supportive of the empowerment of the society to be created. So that was accepted in, in, the, in, the, in the Jain system. Now, at, during that time, there were golden period. We saw the, we observed the coexistence existence of different doctrines. So, so Jain's this concept can be traced back to Jain's uh, Anekartava, where multiple perceptions of the of an object and what can be allowed and should be respected. Uh, and the but Sankhya says that multiple perceptions are due to prakriti. So why I am saying this because to 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 make it clear that different concepts and different doctrines existed in parallel during that time and uh, they, they grew together. So Jainas, Jainas hold that the view that is contaminated by the object, uh, so by the subject leading to the karma. So, so subject uh, uploads your view and that leads to karma. And misrepresentation of the view is known only to the person. I know what I am looking at and how I am representing a view. Others cannot. So I am accountable for that kind of view. And it is a sin. As per Mahayana, it is not an aberration. You can have different views. There is nothing right or wrong. It is conditional. It is it's subjective. Whereas the Christian view of sin is similar to Jainism, uh, where there is social conditions and lead to sin and non-followers. You don't follow the path, you become uh, your sin. Uh, Buddhists would say that this is condition. So, uh, whatever the conditions were there, you you are viewing that object accordingly. So, what this did was. Uh, empowerment did was the it started in era era of universal education. So Buddhism supported using universal education, and so you don't have to be a from a particular caste, creed, or wealth or pedigree. You can attain. You can have the knowledge if you have ability to do so. And self effort was encouraged during that time. So you can attain anything with your self effort. Uh, as you can see, you we observed in the previous slide, previous presentations also that Nalanda and Takshila were the secular schools, and everybody was welcome. Uh, they were university uh, quarters of education. Uh, whereas Bhagavad Gita that kept uh, knowledge kind of secret. So there is a there is there are slokas also uh, in Gita that like, do So it is. It is subject to the faith. If you follow me, uh, you will get this gyan or you get this knowledge. Uh, so this is this is a kind of uh, holding of uh, the knowledge. The Buddhism started to record the writings. One, oh. one minute. Just. Okay. Uh, that was accessible to everyone, and this was irrespective of where you are born, where what is your sanskar. Vedic followers follow, uh, continue to teach for pedigree, this is sanskar. So, effect of this secularization of knowledge, how did it impact the society at that time? So, there was no, so they, what it did was that it did away with the heredity division of the labor, said so that Shudra will do this, uh, Vaishya will do this, Brahman will teach, and Shatya will fight. So, but that disrupted the supply chain, uh, supply chain of the whole system because everybody is now free to do their own thing. I mean, they could, a future could attain uh, knowledge, can teach. Uh, so that was the thing. So, but Cordelia Sastra had proposed that wealth could be created by having this kind of uh, skill groups that could do their particular job uh, in a particular way. 
So yeah, I am running out of time. So that would take just the cosmology during that time. Uh, and they can't remember in Karl Chakra and uh, then there was a religion. So uh, they were uh, Theravada and then there was uh, uh, Bodhisattva during that time and there were monasteries, stupas, chaityas and sangha uh, used to congregate there. And Hindu and Jain, Jain temples existed alongside as we observed in the previous presentations and Dharmshastra is still prevailed. Uh, Dharmshastra and then there was a Manusprati that created a division. Kalitali Shudra was not a Shudra as per se what Manu has prescribed. They were able to do many things that was later on banned by this Manusprati. Uh, and then later development of Buddhism took place because different kings came who supported Buddhism. Uh, so, you know, and then they were developed in Jainism uh, by different kings. Uh, there was support from modern king Sam Samprati who supported uh, Jainism. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.